The Cat, A Tale of Feminine Redemption by Marie Louise von Franz. Chapter 7 The Return. On their way home to the hero's home, the cat says to him, Take this nut with you, but don't open it till your father asks you to give him the linen. When he comes to where his father and his two other brothers are, he just descends from heaven in his fiery car. The father and the brothers are all terrified by his arrival, but he greets them politely, and then the father asks, Have you brought me something, son? The boy says, Yes, father. And with these words, he breaks the nut the cat had given him and finds inside a corn of maize. And within the corn of maize, there is a corn of wheat. And when he sees that, he becomes really angry and thinks the cat has cheated him. It's the devil with the cat, he says, and suddenly feels invisible claws scratching him and he sees blood running down his hands. Then he squashes the corn of wheat and finds the seed of a weed. Then when he breaks that open, finally out comes a hundred meters of thin, fine linen, which he gives to his father. So here the cat gives him what he has to bring to his father in a very strange form. First a nut, then a maize corn, then a wheat corn, then a weed seed, and finally the linen. Four forms, and then a quintessence comes the linen. Now we have to amplify the problem of what a nut in general represents. Nuts frequently appear in mythological literature. They are famous for the fact that they are outwardly hard and edible, and if you don't know how to penetrate their thick shell, you can starve. But finally, within there is a sweet kernel rich in vitamin and fat and very nourishing. It is one of the foods people can keep for a relatively long time and even preserve them for the winter. They can collect them in the autumn and eat them all winter long. It's one of those very original foods of mankind. In medieval mythology, the nut was called a symbol of Christ, of his teaching, because it is outwardly hard and difficult to penetrate. But if one gets into it, then it is sweet and nourishing. That's how the church fathers in the Middle Ages interpreted the nut. The same archetypal idea applies to anything that from outside appears impenetrable, but inside is of positive value. I will leave it at that for the moment and go to the next bit, the corn of maize. Corn is a product of the earth mother and so is associated with fertility, but it has the color of the sun, so it's like a union of opposites. It has a solar quality, but it grows out of the earth and belongs to the great earth mother in fertility. Like wheat, Maize in North American Indian mythology has very much the same role as wheat, the food of Demeter, in Greek mythology. Only I haven't found in American Indian material the additional quality wheat has attributed to it, which is that wheat is always associated with death and resurrection. You even have in the Bible, if that corn of wheat doesn't die, and so on. That alludes to the Elysian Mysteries, where the dead were believed to go back into the womb of the Earth Mother, just like corn is planted in the earth, and therefore it has a meaning of resurrection. The Greeks kept pots in their households containing a kind of honey jam with wheat corns in it. Those pots were a kind of symbolic home symmetry, a symbol of the underworld and the dead in it. At a feast similar to what is now our Faustnacht in Switzerland, the Greeks opened those pots and assumed that then the ghosts, as the underworld was opened, came back, roaming around and making contact with the living for those three days. Afterward, one cleansed the house with the sacred twigs and so on and said to the dead, returned to the underworld and closed the pots again. The pots with those wheat corns were really the underworld with the dead resting within the womb of the Mother Earth. They were a symbol of that, and the dead were also called Demetriuri, the people of Demeter, or those who belong to Demeter. The spiritual symbolic aspect of the wheat is more developed than that of the maize, but basically they have the same meaning, of belonging to the Great Mother. Being the basic food of man, the fertility of the earth, and the life of man, so to speak, only the wheat has this transcendent resurrection meaning as well. Our hero thinks the cat has cheated him, but I will address this intermezzo afterward. The next time, when he crushes the wheat corn, he finds the seed of a weed, something completely useless. I have not found any amplification of the weed, so I only assume from the hero's anger that it is a symbol of complete uselessness, of something one wants to pull out at all costs, a sheer nuisance. After he opens that, he finds the linen, the thing he was looking for, the thing he had to bring to his father, which we amplified already. Now, what does that mean? That can give one a headache. Why, why does the cat give him that sequence of symbols? Nut, maize, wheat, weed, and then the treasure of a quintessence. The nut can be associated with the self in some ways, or an aspect of the self, or an aspect of the totality of the unconscious. Now in German and English too, we speak of cracking nuts as solving problems, a difficult nut to crack, we say, a ticklish problem, something difficult to handle, something that resists a solution, one has to crush it or bite through, 
all containers, anything that serves as a container, have a feminine connotation. But that would be the nutshell. The nut as a whole is not just the feminine, it is a symbol of totality, a feminine container with nourishing content. Then you have the maize, which would be basic human food, the nourishment of Mother Earth and all we have said about nourishment and what that means. And then we have the wheat, which is again a basic nourishment but with a spiritual and transcendent connotation. And then there's something completely useless. The fourth naturally is the useless one, that must be so. And then comes the quintessence, the search for material. What I think is that those four steps are like the stages of the process of individuation, leading to the transcendent function. When we first approach the unconscious, it is a hard nut for us to crack. We can't penetrate it. We don't understand our dreams and so on. We have to bite through to understand dreams and we are repelled until we get into them and find there is a message within, something that nourishes. You often see that in analysis. People who have a heavy depression or some other problem generally, if they have had other types of analysis before or never had any analysis at first are bewildered by our Jungian methods. We say, any dreams, and then we begin to nut crack dream symbols. And they wonder what that has to do with their marital problem or depression until they discover for themselves that yes, their dreams have a life-giving message. And then they begin to realize that nourishing aspect of the unconscious. For instance, they leave the analytic hour feeling better. They came into the hour depressed and they haven't understood much yet, but they feel better, more hopeful. They come in contact with the nourishing aspect of the unconscious, the nut and the maze, and this begins to give some vitality to consciousness, to impart some hope. Wheat would be the next stage, when people begin to notice that in the unconscious there is numinous spirituality. That the dreams are not only good advisors for marital, professional, or sex problems, that would be the resurrection aspect of the wheat, its spiritual, transformative aspect. Then finally comes the wheat. It's the Anantio Dromia. First it's always something better, then suddenly comes something useless. The wheat is certainly in the same row as the other things, as if there is always something more precious, and then there is something that is not precious, but which must therefore, at least to my feeling, be precious through its not being precious. If you think of the Romanian population, then that weed is simply what is useless, but the useless must be precious. Now, what way is the uselessness of the unconscious precious? First, the unconscious is difficult to penetrate, to get to its core. Then you are nourished by it. Then you profit from the spiritual enlightenment the unconscious can give, and that brings a certain spiritual resurrection. Then you proceed to uselessness which means that one has to give up the idea of using it for ego purposes. It is the sacrifice of relating to the unconscious for profit. That comes relatively late in analysis because, naturally, every analyzan first learns to relate to the unconscious in order to profit from it, to have his or her neurosis cured, to get advice for unsolved problems and so on. But after long contact with the unconscious, the day comes when one has to give this up, stop treating the unconscious as a mother who advises one what to do. If you always think, I can't make up my mind, I have to ask the unconscious. Then the unconscious gives ambiguous advice, and that's when people say, the unconscious has cheated me, the unconscious has deceived me. Jung always said that the longer one analyzes, over 10 or 15 years, say, and if you go on with the analysis, then the dreams become much more difficult and complicated. For instance, many old time colleagues come to me from time to time and I love to see them, but I hate it because they bring such complicated dreams. Naturally, they would interpret the others themselves. They know themselves what they can mean, and they are so ticklish, and if I didn't have the comforting expression, well, you know, when you have analyzed for such a long time, it gets so complicated, you can't really use it. It could be difficult. I, I think part of the trick of that is that the unconscious wants to wean the analyzant from child mother or child parent attitude toward the unconscious, wanting to make use of its advice. It becomes like a cryptic riddle. Then, if you can penetrate those seemingly useless dreams, they have much more to do not with insight, but with simply being, teaching people to be, teaching people not to have insight or to realize things, but teaching them just how to be. The best parallel or illustration I know is in Zen Buddhism where, after the Great Enlightenment and the famous series of the Ten Ox for Hearing Pictures, you have finally the picture of the Saturi, the image of the old man at the beggar's bowl going about the market and the description. He has forgotten the gods, he has forgotten the Enlightenment, he has forgotten everything. But wherever he walks, the cherry trees blossom. That means he's become completely unconscious again. Another Zen master once said, After the Enlightenment, you can just as well go into an inn and get drunk and carouse around and just live an ordinary life. Forget all about it again. But naturally, this forgetting is not a regression. 
It is not simply a return to the previous unconsciousness. It's still progress. It's a progression into Taoist uselessness, to just being. And the whole intellectual aspect of the analysis, that one always searches for insight and for instruction from the unconscious, to a great extent goes away. That would be the higher aim. Therefore, I think it is right that it is useless, but at the same time, it is a uselessness that is a higher achievement than the stages before. After the hero finds the linen, the emperor says that whichever of his three sons chooses the most beautiful girl, that one shall be emperor. The brothers agree, and the youngest just sits in this fiery car and goes back with the cap. Now the incident I postponed discussing earlier, in which he gets angry opening the nut, he finds the maize and the wheat and says, the damn cat has cheated me. Then he's scratched by invisible claws and suddenly discovers that his hand is bleeding. The cat is obviously invisibly present. She has come with him, but not in visible form, and that proves, like the fiery carriage, that she is divine. She has the invisible omnipresence of a divine factor. She's not an ordinary cat. It's all underlined that she is really a divine cat. Bastet could do that. A goddess could do that. But an ordinary cat could not. When they arrive back, the cat asks him, Now, what have you done? He tells her everything, and that he should now have a girl, because the son who brings the most beautiful bride shall have the empire. The cat listens very carefully, but says not a word. So, he lives with the cat again for a whole month until one day she says, Don't you want to go home? Oh, I, I don't want to go home. I, I have no reason, he replies. Gradually, they had fallen in love. Then one day, the young hero asks the cat, Why are you a cat? She answers. Don't ask me yet. Ask me some other time. I hate to live in the world. Let's go together to your father. She takes the whip again and makes a sound with it in three directions. The fiery carriage appears, and they both go to his home. Here again, the cat is promoting the process. The man is quite satisfied with the situation as it is, but she isn't. Because as we see from this illusion, she is really unhappy to be a cat. She suffers in her cat state, and now she betrays it. Before, she seemed to be quite cheerful and all right in her cat state. But now she says she's unhappy and hates living in this world. That goes together with the fact that, for the first time, it is said, in time, they began to be in love with each other, before the cat was living in the woods, seemingly happily. She accepts him, and she makes him the emperor and her lord. They live together, but now the cat is suddenly not content. They are developing a human feeling. It's beginning to become a human attachment, a human relationship, and that creates a problem for the cat. Before it seemed, the cat hadn't known there was such a thing or hadn't missed it, but now, by falling in love with the hero and he with her, she begins to long to become human. It is the impulse of the divine to be incarnated, and that would mean, if the man's anima is still a deer or a cat or some other animal, it is more powerful and more magical, but it lacks human qualities. A man who has a divine cat anima, or for that matter a divine bear or deer anima, is in love with a fantasy, with a fascination. These animals are fascinating. When something is divine, it is numinous, and the numinosum is always fascinating. That would mean he is overwhelmed, fascinated by the feminine but he cannot relate humanly to it. He is, in a way, too overwhelmed and too fascinated to have a real relationship. He adores the woman, or he runs after her. He hunts her like a deer, like an animal of prey, but he has not yet any understanding of her as a human being. Now therefore, and quite rightly, the archetypal figure wants to become less divine and more human, wants to incarnate in human form to establish a human relationship. So, for the second time, they go home to the old emperor, and this time when they arrive, the emperor says, Have you no wife? You are not married. Where is your wife? And the young hero shows the cat in her golden basket and says, Here she is. The emperor says, O oh lord, what do you want with the cat? You can't even talk with her. The cat is angered by these words, so she jumps out of the basket and escapes into another room. There she does a somersault and turns into the beautiful girl she was before. So beautiful that you could look into the sun, but you couldn't look at her without being blinded by her beauty. That seems to be a standard fairy tale description of something supernaturally beautiful. It's a wonderful way to describe the numinosum. One just has to shut one's eyes because it's too overwhelming. It shows again that even now, when she takes on human form, she is still overwhelmingly divine, divinely beautiful. Here the emperor makes a silly remark. She gets annoyed and that makes her do her somersault and at least temporarily become human. The emperor, as we have seen, represents the conventional Christian principle of consciousness which toward the animal has the attitude that she is nothing but a cat. That is a collision between the hero, the new form of consciousness, 
who is experiencing the divinity of his animal side, the mysterious spiritual divinity of animal instinct, and the old emperor, who does not see the divinity of the instinct. He is the old principle with the old prejudice, nothing but a cat. You can't talk to a cat. In Italy, for instance, if one scolds people when they torture animals, beat their donkeys, or kick the cat, they very often answer, it's not Christian. That shows the real scorn a certain Christian teaching has taught us. That scorn developed because in earlier times animals were seen as divine and therefore they had to be depreciated. They were pagan gods and had to be put down. It was not hatred of animals that made the early church fathers talk so scornfully about them, but because they had witnessed animal worship they had to put it down. That is what has bred a certain scorn for the animal. It was all a strong ascetic spiritual reaction against the too unconscious, too indulgent life of the late pagan world which had already lost its spirituality and was a decaying civilization. So in compensation there was the stressing of the spiritual which did harm to the instinctual animal world. Our emperor, being blind to the divinity of the cat, now shows this scorn, which irritates her and prompts her to turn into a human being. He teases her into showing her power. So one could say that this scornful remark is not altogether negative because it brings out the other side. By insulting the cat, By despising her, he forces her out. I'll show you, she says, and out she comes. It shows that this Christian development of going against the animal gods had a certain meaning. It created a tension out of which a greater humanization could then emerge. Her somersault is a complete overturning of the standpoint. The head goes down, the feet go up, and then you come back. I once heard of a man with a compulsion neurosis, a theologian's son, who had been brought up very, very strictly Christian in a repressive and negative way. He had all sorts of obsessions and neurotic symptoms and couldn't fall asleep. Then he developed a ritual where he couldn't sleep at night. In bed after his prayer, when the light had been put out, he first made a somersault one way and then a somersault the other. Without the ritual, he couldn't fall asleep. In a Fauster shift for C.A. Meyer, you'll find an article by Dr. Sonja Marshak on the somersault with a lot of amplifications and see that basically it is this turning upside down. This man's compulsion said, in effect, he should give up his present standpoint, turn it completely around, then reverse it again, and then he'd be cured. Every compulsion, though it is destructive and negative in its concrete form, has a symbolic message. If somebody has to wash their hands nervously, they really should clean up their act, but psychologically, not by washing their hands 2,000 times until the skin is off. So that somersault is, of course, absolutely just a stupid ritual and a very sick ritual but it expresses what should be done psychologically. He should completely change his standpoint twice before he would be capable of living. For instance, he should go completely against his parents' strict Christian upbringing and then reacquire it on a living level, on his own personal level, reacquire the same standpoint but differently. Then he would be cured. With compulsive symptoms, he must always ask what the symptom really wants, and that's exactly what should happen. Very often in fairy tales, a somersault is a way to transform it, It's always a ritual of resurrection. For instance, at the Egyptian funerals, you find in the tombs painting the dwarves turning somersaults, doing all sorts of gymnastics, but especially somersaults. That was to help the resurrection of the king. The idea is that resurrection is a kind of somersault. You go down, and then you come up again in a new form. It might also have to do with the fact that, as you know, the baby in the mother's womb, if it is born normally, often makes a somersault before birth and comes out head first. So, the somersault can denote a birth process, and possibly the observation of this fact led the Egyptians to have clowns and clowning doors. Probably they were Bushmen prisoners, really, do somersaults along the route of the funeral procession of the king, which according to the text was meant to support the king's resurrection process. So the cat enacts the rebirth of transformation ritual, and appears as a beautiful girl. Then she comes out of the room and goes right to our hero, the youngest son, and embraces him. When the father and the two brothers see that they are absolutely petrified, then the father becomes very enthusiastic and says to his son, Truly you have the most beautiful wife, and you must have my whole empire. But the girl can't stay long in this state, and while the hero says, No, father, I already have an empire and a crown, she again does a somersault and returns to her cat state and to her little golden basket. Then the emperor takes the crown and puts it on the head of his oldest son. The young hero leaves with the cat, and they return to their own home. While on the way, he scolds her for not remaining a beautiful woman or returning to her cat state. Now, why do you think she can't stay long in the state of a beautiful woman? 
She has to return to her cat's gate because the young son hasn't done anything yet for her transformation. The old emperor has teased her into a transformation by opposition, but the hero hasn't yet done anything for her redemption. On the contrary, he wants to return with her to the cat kingdom. We can say he suffers from inertia. He reproaches her for not staying a beautiful girl, but so far he hasn't taken any steps and she needs his cooperation to transform permanently. But now he is teased enough and she says, I will explain to you later why I have to be the cat. There is a curse on me. So they return home and live again as before. One day while the hero is out hunting, the cat sharpens three sabers. And when he comes back, after they have talked a little, she pretends to be ill. And then, as you remember, she asks that he cut off her tail and cut off her head. And that is the final transformation. So you see the cat goes about it very slowly. Because even when they come home, she doesn't tell him immediately how she can be redeemed but only after they live together again for a while. Then she carefully prepares the sword and pretends to be ill in order to make the hero do something about it. Only then does she ask to cut off her tail and her head. Why does she go about this so carefully? Well, we must imagine the situation of the young hero, not forgetting that the cat is a kind of psychologist and that she has to prepare him psychologically. He is not even capable of sharpening the sword. She has to prepare the situation because he won't do it. If she asked him straight out to cut off her tail, he just wouldn't. And if she asked him to behead her, he would never do that either. He loves her much too much in her cat state, so she really has to prepare him psychologically, prepare the weapons, and then make him suffer by her illness, till she thinks now maybe he is desperate enough to do what she asks. So you see how the cat is superior. But we can only understand why that preparation is so long if we go into the problem of what the beheading and cutting off of the cat's tail and head means. The cat pretends to be ill and he asks, My dear, what's the matter with you? And she says, Oh, I am very sick. If you love me and want to do something good for me, then cut off my tail. It's too big and too heavy. I can't carry it anymore. And the young hero begins to complain. No, you mustn't die. I would rather die myself. I have a cream. I will heal you with that. And when she insists that he should cut off her tail, he finally does. And what happens? She changes into a girl, but only halfway to the hits while the other half remains a cat. And then he makes the same objection when she wants her head cut off. So let's first look at the cat's tail. Dogs do, but cats especially express moods with their tails. Most animals have a face at the front, the head, and behind is another face, the tail. Conrad Lorenz writes a lot about the hind face of animals, the tail with which they express their mood. And this is especially true of cats. They are marvelous. When they are happy, they put their tail up with a little curl on the top and then they lie down, and when they get irritated, they beat a little with the tail, and then suddenly, when they've had enough, they attack. You need never be clawed by a cat. She always warns with her tail first, with this kind of nervous baying. So she expresses her moods, her emotions, her love, her aggression, irritation, friendliness with her tail. Now, if her tail is cut off, what would that mean psychologically? Here we have a divine cat, Anima, a goddess, and in order to become human, her tail must be cut off. One can say, in general, that if something turns human, then one can integrate it. If, in a dream, something appears in a human personification, then you can tell the analyzant that he should be able to integrate it. But as long as it appears in a non-human form, then you can't expect that. He just can't yet. He has to see it and to become aware of it, but he can't yet integrate it. So becoming human means the possibility of integrating the anima, but she must first become human. If the tail is the expression of the unconscious emotions, then cutting off the tail would mean analyzing, discriminating, and differentiating to dissolve it into bits, which would mean a man has first to separate his emotions, the animal emotions in him, and then isolate them, so to speak, so to say to himself, now what is that about? Take for instance, a man who suddenly feels irritated with his girlfriend. If he doesn't cut the tail off his cat, he will just take the mood out on his girlfriend. If he holds the irritation back and continues to talk on the human level, asking himself, why am I so irritated? Why do I feel this way? That's cutting off the tail, isolating one's irritation and then analyzing it. Why does it get my goat when she does this or that? That's how a man would analyze his own anima tail. By asking himself, why is anima suddenly goes thump, thump? Why he gets such feelings? You generally find quite deep, complex problems behind the irritation. For a man, the best way to catch his anima, so to speak, and to begin to integrate it, is to question his moods, his autonomous moods. For instance, 
Why did I wake up ill-tempered this morning? You wake up and you are just in a foul mood. Already breakfast is cold and you can shout at everybody, but then if you analyze that, why did I wake up like that? Where did that come from? When did it begin? What does it really express? You can come to what is happening inside. Our cat goddess becomes human now up to the hips, but above she still remains a cat. So now she looks like some depictions of the goddess Bastet. She no longer looks like an animal, but like a goddess. So the tale obviously has to do not with the goddess aspect, but with the animal aspect. That would be the physical, the instinctual, all the animal reactions. The tail is the hind end, the animal end of her, and the head would be the divine end. First he has to cut off the tail end. That would mean he has to analyze his physical and emotional reactions, including naturally his sexual reactions, everything that comes from his animal nature. When his anima wags her tail in all her different ways, that's what he has to analyze, and then she's humanized. That's an interesting thing in this story. I have never met it before. She is humanized from below upward. She's not humanized from above downward, but from the tail up. That would mean if a man wants to make his cat animal conscious, he has to begin with the tail, with all his animal reactions. I would not confine it to sex. It includes any animal reaction, which means physical, instinctual reactions such as aggression, sex fantasies, irritations, fascinations. Everything that comes up from the body as well as sensations and moods he has during sexual intercourse. That is becoming aware of the anima and all the fantasies that go with her. But then she is only half humanized. She is de-animalized. She is still divine because now she looks like the goddess Bastet, portrayed by the Egyptians as human being with a cat head. Now our cat goddess complains again and asks that her head be cut off. And then she becomes totally human. So let's look at what that means psychologically. We project into the head the sea of intelligence, of sight, of insight, of awareness. In an animal, it wouldn't be scientific thinking. But there are all the senses, smell, the eyes, the ears, the sea of awareness of the world. We don't make contact by looking and sniffing at the behind of an animal. We make contact by looking at the face. Contact with the psyche of human beings and animals is generally by looking into the eyes or by looking at facial expressions. So, what would that be if now he asked to cut off the cat face? You see, that is the great mystery. What is animal in us has a divine and instinctual aspect. By cutting off the tail, a man becomes aware of the instinctual aspect. But then, he must become aware of the divine aspect of cat thinking. Never mind what really goes on in an ordinary cat's head. But what do we project into a divine cat's head? Into Bastet's head? Does Bastet think? Remember what we said about Bastet, that she thinks of festivity, fertility, music, magic. Magic is very important because it is a spiritual activity. Pleasure, the pleasure principle, communion in the village community, and so on. Those are the thoughts of Bastet, spiritual content of Bastet. Perhaps you could sum it up by saying that the magic of life resides in Bastet's head. Now, in a man, the positive anima is the magic of life. That's why a man who is not in contact with his anima is dry, dull, intellectual, and rather lifeless. I have sometimes even defined the anima as the stimulus to life. Everything that stimulates a man or fascinates him comes from the positive anima. That's why if a man has a negative relationship to his anima, he becomes depressed, finds no pleasure in anything, and criticizes everything. You know those gentlemen who come to the table and criticize their wives? The soup isn't salty enough, the meat is stringy, and so on, and they just take up their paper. That's the negative anima. They have no contact with their cat. So the positive anima, the divine bastet anima, would be the stimulus, the magic of life. In order to humanize the anima, a man has to cut that off and analyze it. Why? Because otherwise he projects it onto women and always expects them to produce the stimulus and magic of life just because he can't do it himself. There are men who can only be happy if a warm, friendly, beautiful woman looks after them. And as soon as the woman is away, or has something else to do, or has the flu, they fall into a dark hole. They have an infantile dependence on the projected anima. So in order to humanize their anima, they must not expect the magic of life from their partner. They must find it in themselves and know that this is the divine aspect of the inner anima. They must separate it from the human anima with which he relates to the woman. Then he is capable of relating to the woman as she is and no longer possessed by a subhuman or superhuman anima. By cutting off the head and the tail, he cuts off, so to speak, the subhuman and superhuman aspects of the anima. He brings her to human size, and then he can integrate his feelings and express them in relationship with his partner. 
The hero takes the second sword and cuts off the cat's head, and a beautiful girl appears. All the other cats in the palace become human again, and the whole town looks as it had before. Everybody hails the empress, and he takes that beautiful girl in his arms, kisses her, and is happy, she says to him. From now on, you are my husband. I was cursed by the mother of God until an emperor's son would cut off my head. Now let's go get your father, but be careful of your brothers. They want to kill you. So then they go back to the father. That's very odd. Why? Since she knows his brothers want to kill him, do they go back? His father is absolutely beside himself with delight and falls in love with his son's beautiful wife. He thinks of killing his son in order to have the girl for himself. He says to his son, Go hunting, I want some game. When he is gone, the emperor goes to the cat lady's room. But on his way, a cat appears in his path. He says to his daughter-in-law that she should love him, but she just gives him a slap in the face and says, What do you want, you old horror? When her husband comes home, she tells him what her father-in-law has done and says, We must leave here at once. Let's go home. Obviously, the cat has still not quite lost her divine magic qualities because she knew ahead of time that the situation would be dangerous. And again, after the old man has attacked her, she says, We must leave at once. So she still functions with the right instinct, the magic knowledge of what should be done. But apparently, she says one thing and does another. She knows it's dangerous, that they must watch out. But they go to the court of the old man anyway, and she lets her husband go hunting, though she surely knows that the old emperor wants to sexually attack her. How can one understand this strange kind of reaction? I have the feeling she wants to challenge the old principle in order to have a justification for overcoming it. If they just lived happily ever after in their redeemed cat palace in the woods, then the old emperor with his two eldest sons would continue to rule in the other kingdom. As a result of what happens, he is destroyed. So I think it is typical cat mentality. Something must have teased her into saying it's very dangerous and into going there to provoke or to seek a confrontation. That's also why she slaps the old emperor in the face. Now, what would that mean if the old emperor wants to have his daughter-in-law for himself? There are parallels, but not as tough as this one. There is, for instance, a grim fairy tale called Ferdinand the Faithful and Ferdinand the Unfaithful. There the cat sends a hero to find a beautiful princess for him. And when the hero brings the beautiful princess into the court, quite willing to hand her to the king, the princess says, No, I don't want to marry the old gentleman. I want to marry the man who conquered me. And then with a trip, she kills the old king and marries the hero. There is also a kind of rivalry between the old king, who wants the anima, the beautiful new woman for himself, and the hero. It's not so bad because after all, the hero had fetched her in the service of the king, but here the cat lady is the legitimate wife of the son, and the old emperor tries to just jump in and take her. The old emperor is the old conscious Christian attitude, and if the old conscious attitude now wants to have the newly redeemed feminine for himself, that would look like the Susanna and the Algiers, the lecherous old men. That's a common theme of art and literature. Concretely it exists. We all know it exists. If you take it as symbolic, it's the new wine in old bottles. The emperor symbolizes the old principle of consciousness that wants to integrate or to profit from the renewal of life that has come forth in another domain. He wants to assimilate it and would kill it if he could. That poor cat lady would be like an unhappy old hag within a year if she married the old man. One sometimes sees people at 50 and 60 who dress like hippies and go on drug trips doing all those things that the revolution of the 60s and 70s brought in. One has a sense that they are the old kings trying in a naive kind of way to live it out, and to me that just looks ridiculous. But there are more tricky ways. For instance, I have sometimes been invited by Christian academics of dry theologians who had no success with their congregations, asking me to lecture on union psychology to bring people back to fill the pews again. Then, when the church is full, they push me aside, attack union psychology, and give a long sermon in the old fashion, as if they would try to use this new life to refill their empty temples. They deliver the same old stuff they have always delivered, which no cat would ever tolerate. An old professor of theology once went to Jung and asked for a private interview. Jung received him and the theologian said, Now come, all the women admire you. Tell me the trick. I want to know about it, Jung said. It's just much knowledge and much hard work. Goodbye, professor. But the man didn't give up. He thought Jung had a trick, so then he invited attractive female students to his studio and always appeared with his pants nearly open or bare feet or something, thinking, oh, perhaps it's that. That's the old emperor. First, the emperor wants to have the cat lady, but she resists, so he throws the couple into prison, but they escape and put together a large army and declare war on the father. 
We know the cats have now turned into human beings, but they are still called cats, probably just to denote the army of those who had once been cats. The son overcomes the father, destroys his whole army, and the father alone survives. When he sees that he is completely lost and has no more strength, he says to his son, Please pardon me, I have done nothing wrong in my whole life. Judge rightly and you will rule my empire with justice. Then there is the last line, and where I have come from, that I have told you. It is the right to sort of the storyteller, which has nothing to do with the story anymore. The cat is still very wise and has magic power, and the son is still a bit weak. He is not yet a complete man, and that's why she still has that magic power over him, and why she slyly, in a cat way, really arranges and provokes the confrontation between father and son. She has the intention of making him a man and forcing him to make an absolute stand against the old emperor, not just to go away from it, but to really say what is what. That is absolutely on the mark of what I feel too, namely that something new must not be peacefully inserted into the old habits. There are certain new things that one must have the honesty to call new and to stand up for, because otherwise the new energy is lost. Jung once said something to me after I had been to visit a lot of old relatives and had a catastrophic dream that night. Now, consciously, I thought they were all old horrors, and I made fun of them and went home, but that wasn't enough. The unconscious said, No, this is really dangerous, and Jung said, Yes, if one does not constantly walk forward, the past sucks one back. The past is like an enormous sucking wind that sucks one back all the time. If you don't go forward, you regress. You have constantly to carry the torch of the new light forward, so to speak, historically and also in your own life. As soon as you begin to look backward sadly, or even scornfully, it has you again. The past is a tremendous power. So the overcoming of the old emperor means to be absolutely inexorable, ruthless about what is different and new. That's what I feel we have to say about Jungian psychology. That's why... To the great annoyance of certain of my colleagues, I am against making a cocktail of a bit of Jung and bits of other things, watering the whole of Jungian psychology down until it is again 19th century philosophy, and no longer the shocking newness which I feel Jungian psychology is. It is really shockingly new, but one can also suck it back into the old system and say, oh that, Jungian psychology has a history. It has not fallen from the heavens, so to speak, and of course, Jung has had a lot of historical forerunners. But his way of looking at the unconscious, and even more, the practical way of living with it, in the way he taught it, is completely different from any other school. It's something completely new, and it should not be watered down into past things. But that can happen with anything new. The early Christians, for instance, had the same trouble. Very soon, certain pagan mystery cults said, Oh, Jesus Christ, he is the same as Orpheus and Dionysus. They have even excavated a mystery called Grotto where there is a mosaic on the ground with grapes in the mosaic and an inscription, Jesus Dionysus. There was a tremendous tendency to reunite the whole thing with the past, to retranslate the new message into the past message and not vice versa. So the new message and the past message are very similar and then the question is, shall we translate it that way or this way? The early fathers therefore always insisted on saying, although Christ is similar to Dionysus, Orpheus and so on, he is different. It is something new. It is another way of life. It is not just a variation of what is already known. And that is important because otherwise the life goes out of it again. It's just the old stuff and then becomes a tired, dull thing. That's what the old emperor always tries to do with the new possibilities of life. Now on the personal level, it is the same. People regress. Children who have left home and they visit again, go back to their hometown or to their old profession and old surroundings. They experience these regressions. The past catches them, and many have not the hardness or the guts to make a break. In certain situations, one has to make a cut with the past and say, It's finished. Done. In my own life, for instance, the most painful thing was that after I had been in analysis with Jung for a while, I outgrew a lot of my former friends. They weren't really great friends, but acquaintances with whom I went out and enjoyed going out and so on. And suddenly they bored me to tears. I had gone beyond them. I couldn't communicate, but they wanted to go on in the same old way, the same superficial way it had been. There, to have the firmness to just get rid of the past and seem very cruel and unfeeling. I had tremendous conflict in certain cases. Some of my old friends, naturally, were real friends I have kept. That's obvious. But there were many people with whom I had just done the silly old-fashioned things, and there was no life in it anymore. There is a sense in this fairy tale that she, the cat, is the linen which the old emperor had yearned for and sent his sons out to find. 
The old order knows in some unconscious or fantasy way what it lacks, and when it comes into view, it wants to take it over and claim it for its own, even though a generation has come between. There one has to leave the old emperor alone. One has to leave the past to itself. Let the dead bury their dead, as Christ said.